Ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Michael Hennerich. I work for Analog Devices in the System Development Group. Um, I'm also a licensed ham amateur for almost 30 years now, so it's kind of proud to stand here and talk to this uh, well-educated crowd here. Um, today, I want to focus on the multi-channel phase coherent transceiver system with a GNU radio interface. So yesterday, uh, there were some good talks. Uh, we learned about uh, LO synchronization and baseband synchronization and how important those things are in the multi-channel systems. Um, today, I want to focus a little bit um, on, oh, we're not seeing the presentation. Why? Duplicate slideshow. Yeah. Here we go. Um, today I want to focus a little bit on how it's being practically implemented on a, on a, on a system. Um, I have lots of light, uh, so in the interest of time, I want to skip some of them. Uh, so, but I wanted to start with where our uh, multi-channel phase coherent systems are important. And the first thing that came to my mind uh, is basically a, a radar system. There are kind of different radars, but phase array techniques are pretty common. So uh, a traditional FMCW radio system requires a lot of bandwidth, uh, which is typically not that much applicable to integrated RF transceivers, but uh, next-gen MIMO or phase MIMO systems are very well uh, suited for integrated transceivers. So what are the important system factors? It's low phase noise, high bandwidth, and of course, synchronization between channels. Uh, also, dynamic range is uh, very important. So I mentioned phase array. I want to give a brief introduction what phase array is. Um, so radar system utilizes uh, an array of elements. Uh, there's either analog or digital phase shifters, which provide directionality. Uh, this eliminates mechanical ro rotations of, of the antenna. And uh, typically, each of these channels in this multi-channel system processes a different phase. So you can steer the waveform out of uh, the antenna at a certain angle. So there are two main beamforming techniques. One is analog beamforming, where the phase shifting happens in the analog domain and uh, typically uses uh, discrete phase shifters. The other one, uh, which is becoming more and more popular, is uh, digital beamforming, where the beamforming happens in the digital domain uh, by using numerical controlled oscillators or digital filters. The, the main improvement uh, or the main advantage is the multi-beam capability of such a system. So you can steer out multiple beams at the same time uh, and you can steer them really, really fast. Uh, there are also some mixtures between analog and digital beamforming, uh, which is called like hybrid beamforming, where you basically use both techniques at the same time. Uh, here's an example of an analog beamformer. Uh, this is a four-channel one. It can adjust the phase uh, between 0 and 360 degrees uh, with some certain resolution. And you can also store uh, some settings in a very fast hopping uh, memory, and you can recall it very, very fast. So uh, there are phased array dynamic range and spurious improvements that can happen. So after RX phase and amplitude calibrations, um, uh, the system is time and amplitude aligned and uh, the system performance is better than an individual receiver. So when the number of uh, channels are being doubled, the effective number of bits are also doubled and the noise spectral density is lowered. And also if the channel spurious contribution are uncorrelated, the spurious do not add, um, but the noise flow lowers. So we can see a 10 log n improvement in dynamic range. Similar things apply for the TX as well. So if the TX amplitude uh, is phase uh, calibrated, um, the TX signals can, uh, can be combined constructively. Uh, spurious Fourier, uh, system phase noise uh, improvements can be achieved. But the, those improvements rely on uncorrelated channels, which uh, typically require separate PLL sources to the subarrays so the noise do not add up constructively. So if they are uncorrelated, we can also see a 10 log n phase noise improvement, uh, which leads that the channel throughput can be increased. 
So how, how to, to make those channels being uncorrelated? There is an interesting application note. It's called RF transceivers enable force spurs decorrelation in digital beam forming phase array. Uh, and the, the, the main idea behind this is uh, in each of your channels, you offset your local oscillator by a, a certain offset. And then uh, you correct for that offset in the digital domain using a numerical controlled oscillator. And to the right, you see if they are <coughs> Um, if they are not correlated, uh, not decorrelated, they basically add up the spores and the images. And if they are uncorrelated, they they don't add. So what I mentioned integrated transceivers. What, what are those? It's basically a single chip which contains a full RX and a full TX uh, path with ADCs, DACs, down converters, mixers, filters, gain, amplifiers, and so forth. There's often a microcontroller on chip, which does a, a lot of additional calibrations. Um, so how does integration uh, lead to a smaller footprint? So these integrated transceivers uh, can enable lower size, weight, and power SDR systems uh, by having multiple uh, channels on the same chip. And uh, that leads to that they can be used as a backbone in, in phase array systems. So I mentioned the built-in calibrations. So just to mention a few, there's a digital pre-distortion available on some chips. Uh, there's also some spurious rejection algorithms. And of course, there's quadrature correction, LO leakage correction, and, and a few other things. Um, so the ADLV 9009 has been mentioned uh, over the last two days quite a few times. Uh, this is uh, how it looks like. It's a 2RX, 2TX uh, system. Uh, it features 200 megahertz uh, bandwidth and has a lot of additional uh, digital features built into the chip. Um, the multi-channel system that I'm talking about today is basically built on the RF SOM. Uh, it's basically two of those chips, making it a 4x4 four four on, uh, on a PCB together with the ginormous MPSOC FPGA from Silings. There is, in addition, multiple banks of DDR4 memory and uh, also complete integrated power. So, but the main topic is about talking about synchronization and how we can phase align um, multiple of those modules in, in a system that can scale. Uh, so there are multiple, th multiple things uh, that needs to be calibrated, and they are typically done in a certain order. So, for example, there's the, the, the clock synchronization, where they basically synchronize the clocks about uh, across multiple layer, uh, layers in your topology. Um, then there is the multi-chip uh, synchronization, where you align the basebands of all these different chips. Of course, there is a digital link between uh, the FPGA and the transceivers. Uh, typically, this is a JST204 inter interface that also needs to be aligned, calibrated, so that you s have a deterministic latency. Uh, and of course, uh, yesterday we heard about LO, uh, LO synchronization, and that's what I call, call here RFA synchronization, uh, which is also important. And of course, there's more. Uh, on the application layer that we are not going to talk about here today. So let's start looking into JST204 and what it is and how it can be synchronized. So first of all, um, traditionally LVDS, uh, parallel interfaces have been used between converters and, um, and FPGAs. As the number of channels increase, this becomes uh, not practical anymore. And also if the data rates in, uh, increase, uh, you're kind of uh, limited by the electrical signaling. So newer uh, converters use uh, a high-speed serial interface uh, using the JST204 standard. So what is the JST204 standard? It's designed as a high-speed serial link, data link between converter devices and a logic device. Uh, it supports up to 32 lanes per link. And, uh, and the, the lane rate or the link rate can be up to 32 uh, gigabits per second. Uh, with the latest addition to the standard in 204C. The standard also describes the data mapping and framing, the multi-chip synchronization, and also how deterministic latency can be achieved. If you look at uh, the architecture of such a system, there's typically a, a transmitter, a receiver, and then there's a clock chip, uh, 
between the transmitter and the receiver, there are the high-speed uh, lanes, the link. Then there is another kind of a handshaking synchronization signal uh, that goes from the receiver to the transmitter. And for subclass one deterministic latency, uh, there's also a SUSREF um, signal required, which synchronizes um, both transmitter and receiver uh, to the same instant in time. So there are multiple layers. There's a physical layer, which describes the high-speed series, the clock recovery, and the signal shaving, a link layer, uh, which uh, has like the character replacement, the 8B, 10B coding, a transport layer that I'm not going to talk about today, and then, of course, there's an uh, application layer. So to understand deterministic latency, also only the link layers is, is, interested, is interesting here. <clears throat> I need to skip a little bit, otherwise, this is all obvious. What is an FPGA? What is a logic device? Um, and what is a link? I mentioned that the link consists of multiple uh, independent lanes. Um, it uses 8B, 10B encoding, and uh, has, typically has an embedded clock, or it has an embedded clock. Uh, it also supports uh, data scrambling. So how does link synchronization work in general? So the receiver uh, asserts the synchronization pulse, or the synchronization strobe, that then the transmitter repeatedly sends the cage character. Uh, the receiver po uh, performs a, what's called being a code group synchronization and character alignment. Uh, after that's being done, the receiver deasserts uh, the sync, and the transmitter sends the initial lane alignment sequence followed by the data. So latency. Uh, propagation over the data link takes time. Uh, Jesse defines the latency as the time difference between uh, when the sample is inserted in the TX framer and outputted by the RX framer. So part of this latency is uh, being fixed. It's digital pipeline delays, trace lengths, and also part of this latency depends on manufacturing and environmental conditions such as uh, process, voltage, temperature, and also uh, like PCB propagation delays. A lot of systems are uh, latency sensitive, so all closed loop control systems, and of course also radar is one of those systems. So what is deterministic latency? So latency can be defined as deterministic when the time uh, from the input of the just the 204 transmitter to the output of the receiver is consistently the same number of clock cycles. So in parallel implementation, this is rather simple because the clocks are carried uh, in parallel with the data. In serial implementation, this is, uh, this is a bit more difficult because <coughs> there are multiple clock domains. Uh, the standard says that end-to-end -end latency is consistent and deterministic across PVT and uh, also between power cycles, link up, link down, and so forth. Uh, all the non-deterministic components are not removed, but however, they are compensated, and that basically um, uh, is something that I want to talk a little about in the next slides. Uh, there are uh, different subclasses. Um, subclass zero, there is no deterministic latency. In subclass one, it's, it's using SysRef to achieve that. And what basically SysRef does, it aligns the local multi-frame clock. It's a clock that's running in, in the link layer uh, of, of the JSD stack. Uh, and uh, this SysRef pulse is basically synchronizing uh, this uh, clock across multiple devices. Uh, so I mentioned it before, SysRef is the pulse that does it, and SysRef is source synchronous to the device clock. So deterministic latency uh, is achieved by using an elastic buffer with, with an uh, appropriate release point. So we see the lanes here in this example, lane zero, lane one, and lane two, they all arrive at, at, at a different time. And we need to make sure that the release opportunity on the link happens after the last uh, lane arrives. And the, the release opportunity is, uh, is synchronous to the to LMFC. Okay. So a lot of pe people think JSD 204 is complicated, and uh, um, in theory, it, it is a little bit complicated, but um, 
uh, we have created this uh, Jesse interface framework, which makes it much, much simpler. Um, it's basically an integrated software and hardware uh, framework that covers the entire stack. So we have uh, hardware, we have generated uh, HD block, HDL blocks for, for the linked layer. Uh, we have software drivers that configure the linked layer, the physical layers, um, as well as the transport layers. Um, it has been co-designed for improved interoperability, so it is really a framework. And the key features here uh, are that you basically say, I'm, I'm a converter, I have this amount of converters, it's, it's like link parameter equals M. Uh, I want to use that, uh, that many lanes, and I want to run at that baseband rate, and then uh, everything is being um, set up and configured uh, without any other user intervention. So we also try to make it, uh, make it kind of fail safe, and uh, because a lot of things can go wrong, uh, we have implemented a statistical eye scan, so you can look uh, at, at the eye opening of your gigabit zero links without using uh, expensive instrumentation devices. It's actually a feature that's being built into the Silinx gigabit transceivers that's being used here. We have clock rate monitoring, uh, so we can detect bad clocks. Uh, lane sequence monitoring, which one uh, arrive first. You can see uh, during the, the ILA uh, phase, there's also some, some data transmitted over the links. So you can see if you have a lane swap, which is rather because the lanes can be swapped multiple times in hardware, in software, inside the converters, inside the FPGA. So sometimes this can cause problems. We also have sysref alignment monitoring, which basically is, helps you to detect um, setup and hold violations for the sysref signals. So the, the next thing in the, the synchronization is the multi-chip synchronization. This is where we, um, where we synchronize the baseband signals uh, or the baseband path of multiple transceivers. Um, it's also using the sysref and the ref clock, uh, but this time it's not synchronizing the Jesty link, it's more synchronizing the internal dividers of the chip. Um, the NCOs, uh, all, all the state uh, that's, that's, that's in the chip needs to be synchronized if you want to synchronize multiple uh, parallel instances in your multi-channel system. So, where are those latencies uh, in a modern transceiver? Um, so, of course, there's analog circuitry delay, there's ADC cycle delay, and of course, there's digital processing pipeline delay in all the digital filters, in the numerical controlled oscillators, in the quadrature error correction things, and if you don't reset them, um, you you end up with non-deterministic uh, behavior of your of your system. So the latency uh, is fixed, is deterministic, but it depends on uh, on settings just like the what's the basement rate, uh, what's the ADC clock, and of course what of those digital filters are being enabled and uh, how many coefficients are in my uh, FIR filter and uh, if, if this correction algorithm is enabled or not. So what is RF phase synchronization? Uh, yesterday it was referred as LO synchronization. The, the RF phase synchronization is a new feature on our latest generation of RF transceivers. It provides a deterministic phase across uh, power cycles, uh, LO frequency changes uh, between initializations as well as uh, across temperature. It works across multiple uh, devices in a, in a, in a multi-channel system. Uh, what, what we need to say here is that the phase is, is, is not zero between all them, but it is, it is fixed and it's consistently fixed. So each, each of those transceivers do have a fixed phase. So uh, how can that be measured? Uh, here uh, we see some, um, some phase values of different transceivers. Um, and after this, this phase calibrations, they all settle to the same value back. Uh, this can also be shown 
with multiple devices. They all settle uh, to the same value after the phase synchronization. And also here, uh, this is a, a phase analyzer. Uh, we see that the phase goes all, all over the place during initializations or during uh, PLL frequency changes or if you turn the radio on and off. But afterwards, the, it, it settles back to the original value. Also, uh, for factory calibration, you can actually take this phase offset uh, of your given transceiver and, and store it, for example, in an in a on-chip memory. The overall system considerations, so the overall phase synchronization uh, is determined by a number of, of factors. First of all, the, the board level clock routing, uh, the on-chip reference path routing, uh, the PLL and LO divider paths, and of course also the uh, RF and antenna paths. Um, the, the LO phase synchronization that I'm talking here about method addresses only the initial PLL phase and LO divider stage. So if you wouldn't do that, every time you change a frequency or do a hop, your phase would be all over the place because uh, the internal dividers are not being reset or are not being tracked. Also, there is a temperature dependence and, and a drift, and also this is being addressed by this uh, RFA synchronization feature. So wh what, does it, what does it bring us? It, it, it gets us a more consistent startup con uh, condition, uh, and your antenna calibration needs to be run uh, less frequently. Um, you, you would need to run the, you, you always have like a, a, lo a lot of phase difference just by your antenna path. So think about you have a 300, oh, let's take an easy number, 3 gigahertz uh, divided by the speed of light. It's 10 millim 100 millimeter wavelengths. For example, if, if your cabling or your antenna elements just drift by one millimeter, that gives you um, a phase offset by 3.6 degrees. So just temperature changes a lot of, uh, of, a lot of phase, so you always need uh, antenna calibration but you don't need to run that uh, that frequently. So the last point here is the distributed multi-chip multi clock synchronization. Uh, so what are the requirements? The requirements are that all uh, clocks need to be aligned across multiple layers in, in your clocking tree. You also need to be meet setup and hold for, sys, uh, for synchronization uh, signals just as sysref. The problems are if you increase the number of channels, also the number of clocks increase in your system. Um, in a multiple de uh, device clock structure that is based on simple clock buffers, controlling setup and hold is really uh, sometimes challenging. And of course, very important is also that you maintain a deterministic phase across multiple layers in your clock hierarchy while maintaining very important things like clock chitter, phase noise, and you don't want to add additional clock spurs um, to your, to your uh, downstream devices. So um, in general, there are two different techniques on, on clock distribution. One is uh, really what's being called clock distribution. That means you, you distribute the, the maximum uh, clock uh, that's required to all the downstream devices and all the downstream clock distribution chips are just using a, a down-divided version of that clock. So you only need one VCO in the system, and all the, all the noise is kind of uh, correlated. And the other, the other thing, this becomes really uh, difficult if you have like larger systems um, or distributed systems. So the other method is what's being called uh, reference distribution. This is where a much lower reference frequency is distributed across multiple layers in your clock topology. Um, but this, this reference clock uh, is much lower frequency, and you can also route it through backplanes and, uh, and other things. So the, the penalties here is that every, every stage needs uh, another uh, PLL and VCO, which can be rather a little bit more expensive. So there's some cost uh, penalty involved with that. Um, at, at the beginning, we heard about that correlated uh, phase noise uh, can be sometimes good and can be sometimes bad. Um, when, when you use the reference distribution, it is actually pretty good. Um, 
So you, it, it gets you this uh, SFDR improvement. Uh, what's being used on this RF system on module is uh, an HMC 7044. Uh, we can use it in both uh, techniques, clock or reference distribution. Uh, it, it has a lot of things that, that makes it kind, kind, kind of unique because we, we can both reference and clock distribution um, and it can be synchronized um, across multiple layers in the system. Uh, it has 14 uh, low noise uh, configurable outputs and also each of these outputs can be fine, uh, fine delayed uh, adjusted. This is how, uh, how the setup is on, on a 4R4T uh, on, the mult, uh, on the SOM itself. So we have two ADRV 9009s and one HMC 7044 and it's just like providing ref clock and sysref to, the, to the both devices. There's nothing special in the setup. But of course, we see the, the sync input, which allows that multiple um, of these uh, system on modules can be synced. So this is the example for an 8R80 um, synchronization that you always add another, uh, another layer with another clock chip on top of it. And it's always going like top-down synchronization. And as we can see, we, we can play this game for a little bit more and we can expand the clock tree and also scale our number of uh, channels uh, using, using this approach. So multi-channel phase offset validation. So if, if you want to validate that your multi-channel uh, system is phase coherent, uh, the best way is to actually measure the phase. Uh, there are many ways, to many ways to measure phase, but I want to discuss two here. One is averaged instantaneous phase, uh, and the other one is using a cross-correlation method. Uh, what kind of source signals do we use? Um, we either use sinusoids with the averaged instantaneous phase method, or uh, we use a noise source with the cross-correlation method. Typically, uh, they both need to be uh, higher signal-to-noise. Um, Travis, my colleague, implemented two hierarchical blocks that are both available uh, on our GitHub. I think one of the slides actually have uh, the, the, the URL. So this method is easy to implement, works great with sinusoids, uh, but is a little bit more sensitive to sample offset, how it works. We, 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 we take the channel, multiply conjugate, uh, compute the, the angle, uh, then we kind of multiply constant to scale it into degrees, and then we average it. The other hierarchical block uh, is the cross-correlation method, and it, it basically uses, um, uses uh, forward FFTs, multiply conjugate, do a reverse FFT, then we compute the, the, the magnitude spectrum, and then we take uh, the, the bin with the, the highest power, and and then select the, 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 the complex value from it, and on that bin, uh, that represents the phase uh, of our signal. Uh, also, the index from, from, from that uh, bin um, can directly translates into a sample delay. This is how uh, the measurement setup looks like. We, we use the one TX from, from one device uh, either provide us uh, like a sine wave or uh, playback a, a noise spectrum, feed it into a four-way power splitter, and then feed the, the signal back into the uh, receivers. This is how the flow graph uh, looks like for the average instantaneous phase. Um, we, we have the ADOE 9009 um, GNU radio source. Uh, feed it in the hierarchical block and um, visualize it. This is an example here. On, on the bottom we see a, a frequency spectrum, the, uh, the time spectrum, and, and the phase. So the, the blue one is the, uh, the reference and the two other channels are uh, the other two receivers. 
So you can, you can play that over and over. You can restart the system. You will always measure the same phase offset. This is the flow graph for the cross-correlation method. Um, again, the source. Uh, this time we, we correlate only like two channels. Uh, it goes into the phase estimator uh, block. Uh, then we average and also visualize. This shows the, the cross-correlation, uh, then the sample offset. And so we see we have no sample offset, and we also can measure the, the phase. You, you can start playing with your radio. If you start turning on some calibrations on one device and not on the other device, you actually see how uh, that you basically get a sample offset. Um, so these blocks are really handy. And uh, if someone is interested, they are exist on our, our GitHub. So what are the conclusions? End-to-end uh, -end deterministic latency in RF phase and frequency synchronization uh, can, be, can be realized in a multi-channel system using the latest generation uh, of integrated transceivers. Um, the multi-chip LO phase synchronization simplifies uh, phased array beamforming. Uh, the, the spurious force decorrelation can improve your uh, system dynamic range, and also your uh, transmit uh, phase noise. Uh, it always requires a, a very flexible uh, clocking uh, and synchronization uh, topology, and of course, uh, also all your, imp your traces, uh, everything needs to be impedance and length matched in order to actually synchronize those uh, things. Um, the phase offsets can be measured, uh, they can be avoided, or most of the time, they're just compensated. Uh, and last but not least, GNU Radio is a very effective tool to build, model, uh, analyze, and visualize multi-channel software design find radio systems. So that kind of finishes my talk today. Round of applause, round of applause.